Hi. <laughs> so what's it like being a mum? Never become too predictable is my secret. <laughs> Since I uh, last spoke here, which is a couple of years ago, it was Mother's Day, and um, our family has grown. So now we have another question in our family. What's it like being a grandma? And Charles is asking, how can I possibly be a grandpa? And we're very thankful to Kate and William, who have affirmed grandparents by giving grandparents names to their daughter, calling her Charlotte, which is grandpa, Elizabeth, great-grandma, and Diana, grandma deceased. So their family's growing and our family is growing. So within the last two years we have a, another wonderful son-in-law called Valera who married Laura and then Hannah and Fazam had a little girl, Hope. And then Hannah and Fazam had another little girl, <laughs> Dawn. So now we have these two gorgeous little grandchildren little granddaughters. That was the day that Dawn was actually born and Hope's trying her best to be the big sister. And she was trying here to organize her for a photograph. And eventually they made it. And these are our little granddaughters. As my sister says, those are big picture names. I love that. Hope and Dawn. It's funny, you suddenly become um, a parent. Lots of preparation, but there's a moment that you aren't and then there's a moment that you are. And you suddenly, therefore, become grandparents too. And they are the two most important jobs in the world. And yet they actually get very little training other than life. Life's our training. Let me tell you a little story. This is not a personal one to me, but it shows how try as we might, as parents and grandparents, we often don't get things right. One day my grandma was out and my grandpa was in charge of me. I was maybe two and a half years old. Someone had given me a little tea set as a gift, and it was one of my favorite toys. Grandpa was in the living room, engrossed in the evening news, when I brought him a little cup of tea, which was just water. After several cups of tea and lots of praise for such yummy tea, my grandma came home. My grandpa made her wait in the living room to watch me bring him a cup of tea, because it was just the cutest thing. Grandma waited, and sure enough, here I came down the hall with a cup of tea for Grandpa, and she watched him drink it up. And then she said, as only a grandma would know, did it ever occur to you that the only place you can reach to get water is the toilet? <laughs> That's one of Hope's favorite games as well, is tea party, tea party. <laughs> So even with the best of intentions, <laughs> things can go wrong. And the way we get things wrong as grandparents and parents can profoundly affect our children. Life is a journey. It's a cliche, but it's true. And sometimes the mistakes of those closest to us become a roadblock for us on that journey. The past is past, that's why it's called the past, it's past, and yet a lot of us have the past as the main driving force of the present that we live in. And if you've got stuck in your life's journey and you are defined by your past, then my prayer is for you today and it's my prayer that you will get drawn back into God's purposes for you, that you'll move through and beyond the mistakes of others. This is for everybody, whether you're a man, a woman, a child, a parent, a grandparent. This is a message for all of us. If you've got your Bibles with you, I'd like you to turn to Isaiah chapter 40. Verse 11. And we read there about a good shepherd. And this is what he does. He tends his flock like a shepherd... He gathers the lambs in his arms, he carries them close to his heart, and he gently leads those that have young. You couldn't have a more beautiful sentence for Mother's Day than that last one. He gently leads those that have young. And mothers be encouraged, he is gently leading you through all of motherhood if you let him. Sometimes we get so busy we don't allow ourselves to be gently led anymore. 
So keep listening as a mom, however busy you are. Keep close to the heart of Jesus. If you have to lock yourself in the bathroom to do it, lock yourself in the bathroom. And this verse is so much more than encouragement to mothers. It's actually an enormous encouragement to all of us. It has something to say to all of us. And I'm not going to do an exposition of this verse as such. I just want to take us into the verse as an experience where God will help us identify where we are in this verse, where we are in this picture of this shepherd and sheep and lambs. I've only ever spoken on this verse once before. There's a reason for that. When I spoke on it 30 years ago, when I just had one little girl, I very much focused on how God gently leads those that are with young. And I, I love to illustrate. I love pictures and I love objects. And my um, stepdad is a farmer. So I said, I'm going to speak on this in this little church in a little village. Can I um, get you to bring a lamb? And I, I'll put the lamb on the stage, on the platform, and everybody can look at the lamb and then they'll understand the vulnerability, how it needs protecting, etc. So he turned up with his trailer and he left the mother outside and we took the lamb inside and I started and I opened up this verse and I started to speak and everybody was gazing adoringly at the lamb and looking at how vulnerable it was and then we all heard and this big patch of wet appeared on the platform and I could not believe that this tiny little body could produce so much liquid and I thought well it's going to stop and I'll just continue and it didn't stop it just went on and on and everybody looked at the lamb and they looked at me and I just completely lost it and started falling about with giggles and all my wonderful profound points had gone out the window it eventually stopped and I jumped in, hoping it was not going to start again, but I think my message was lost. <laughs> so I decided not to bring a lamb this morning. I had thought about it. I had actually, there's up Highway 48. They're the only lambs I can find around here, but I, I, um, wisdom got the better of me. So <laughs> there's nothing for you to look at. You can just focus on what God has for you. And I wonder where you are in this picture. Are you in the flock? just part of the people's church, not closely connected to the shepherd. You kind of just come in, graze on a bit of green grass and go out again. Are you actually gathered into his arms? Do you have your own personal intimate relationship with Jesus? So intimate that you are being carried close to his heart. You hear his heartbeat. His heartbeat becomes your heartbeat as you go through life, as you look at the world, as you feel. Are you allowing yourself to be gently led because you're a parent are you actually an older person so you're at the end of this journey and you are now gently leading maybe you're a teacher or a mentor or a discipler or a grandparent or a pastor maybe you have a role in this church body where you're gently leading other people the beautiful thing about this verse is that it describes the shepherd and he is a very active shepherd. He's a shepherd who tends and gathers and carries and leads all the generations. So he's very busy. I wonder if this morning you're benefiting from his busyness or just completely detached from it. He cares for the whole flock. Caring is what we love to do as mums and grandmothers and leaders. We love to care. We get to a place often with those that we look after where we say, I'm not ready to let you go yet. I've talked here on Mother's Day about letting go before. I've talked about parents letting go of their children. I've talked about eagles and pushing them out of the nest and letting them fly and coming up under them and letting go. But today I actually want to talk also about children letting go of their parents. I've never heard anybody speak from this angle on Mother's Day, but it's a really, really important part of Mother's Day. This verse contains my story, and it probably contains yours. We have to let go of our children in order for them to find their own way to God. And we don't want to just show them the way, some of us. We want to accompany them all the way on the way. But we can't, and we mustn't do that. You can't go on 
honeymoon with your kids when they get married. <laughs> there comes a point <laughs> when you let go of them. And when we let go of showing them the way, they have the opportunity to discover he is the way and discover that personally for themselves. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And wise parents let go of their children gradually so the child doesn't have to kick and scream and set themselves free. It comes gradually and wise parents know they can only accompany their children so far. Parents have limits. I love the picture in the Gospels of mothers who continually bring their children to Jesus. And why do they do that? They do it because they've come to the end of themselves. They, the child has needs and they can't attend to the needs, so the child needs healing. And they bring their child to the healer. The child needs life and they bring their child to the one who gives life. We have limits. Grandparents and parents can't get it right. And it's a wise parent or leader who knows their limits and allows the child to be gathered out of their arms and into the arms of the shepherd. How I long to gather you, Jesus said. He longs to gather every person sitting here, every person. Are we as parents helping or hindering the gathering process? And what part do we play in this gathering the shepherd gathering the lambs in. Well, we don't meet their every need, and therefore they need to look beyond us. We let them experience dissatisfaction so they can discover the one who satisfies. We let him protect them. We can't protect them all the time, even though we would love to. And we firmly get a hold of the fact that the Good Shepherd doesn't just care about our children, he cares for our children. There's an enormous difference. There's a lot of people I care about, I don't care for them. There are some people I care for. I'm intimately involved with them and their well-being. I care for them. The Shepherd cares for us. He neither slumbers nor sleeps. He watches over. And if one of the sheep wanders off, you know the story about the lost sheep, he doesn't say to the mother, go and find your lost sheep. He goes and he finds the lost sheep and brings the lost sheep home, letting go so he can bring the child back. He can take care of our children. He does take care of our children. Let me illustrate that to you. As I've been a mum, I've had a little category in my mind. You might have this category, but you might not have named it as such. And this is the category. It's the, this is a day I don't need to worry about my child day. And in that day, my child is in school. So there's a parent looking after the child. Or my child is at the house of a good friend rather than a bad friend. And there are good parents. And I'm okay because I don't need to worry about my child on this day. So... Last November, I was having a I don't need to worry about my child day, because even though your children grow up, you still have concerns about them. I was heading off um, on a flight to the West Bank where I was meeting up. We were a team of 12 women. And en route, I was praying for my children. Often when I'm traveling, I just find I miss them more. I don't know why that is, but I do, so I pray for them. I don't seem to feel as safe for them when I'm a long way from home. And as I was praying for Matthew, my son who's a pilot, I was having a I don't need to worry about Matthew day because I knew he wasn't flying in the sky. And he does most days and I've just learned to surrender that to God. But I was relaxed because this week Matthew was not up in Fort McMurray where he lives. He was down in Wichita in Kansas and he was on a course which would enable him to um, have a new skill in, in his flying. So I just thought, this is great, Matthew's on the ground all week, I can relax. I arrived in Istanbul, I rarely put on my phone when I'm changing flights, but I put it on, and there was a net message from Charles saying, call home. And I had just spent about two days with my mum and dad, and my dad's 92, and my mum's 84, and I just thought something's happened to my dad, I'm going to be turning back and going to England. Anyway, I called home, and it wasn't my dad, it was, it was Matthew. And Matthew was in the training centre down in, in Wichita and that morning he had gone in with a group who were to be trained and they'd been shown the simulators, they'd been introduced to the instructors, they'd just gone to do some classroom work and then in the afternoon they were 
going to really begin the course. And unbeknown to them, a pilot took off from that airport and got into difficulty and turned around and tried to get back to the runway, and he was unable to, and his plane landed on the building that Matthew was in. So the pilot was killed. The two instructors Matthew had met an hour before were killed. The simulator was blown sky high, and everybody ran out of the building. So, by the time I arrived in the West Bank, I was a bit of a basket case, because was, I was so far from home. And yet, in that time, I had to rethink the way I worry about my children. I found that a really hard moment, and I thanked God that he had carried my child in his arms, but I was painfully aware that there were other mothers whose sons were killed that day, and I don't understand why God chose to save Matthew, but I firmly believe that he did. In that moment, I realized there's no point having I don't need to worry about my child days, <laughs> whether they're in the air or on the ground. They all have to be I don't need to worry about my child days, because wherever they are, God is able to look after them if that's what he chooses to do. God is a gathering God. He gathers us. How often I longed to gather you as children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were not willing. It's very painful watching a child who's not willing to be gathered. Very, very painful. He's the gathering God. How do I know he's the God who gathers us into his arms? How do I know that if we listen to him, we will find our way back to the heart of God. Well, I know because I was the lamb who needed gathering. I was a child who didn't grow up in a home that um, would be called a Christian home. We didn't talk about God. We didn't acknowledge God. God was kind of vaguely there in the background. And I had a longing to be gathered, but I didn't know that, and I didn't understand there was a gatherer. I'm going to tell you very briefly my story to illustrate how God gathers people. It's not unique. <laughs> it's probably very typical. My story reminds me a little bit of the story of Hansel and Gretel. That's a fairy story. I don't know if you know that story. But in Hansel and Gretel, there's a husband and a wife, and they have a boy and a girl, and the mother dies, and the father marries again, and there's a stepmother. And in, in fairy stories, the stepmothers are always wicked. I'm sorry if you're a stepmother. I'm sure you're absolutely beautiful, but if you were in a fairy story, it wouldn't be. So the wicked stepmother says, I don't like the children, and she's all jealous, and she says, send them off to the forest. And so the weak little husband goes off to the forest, and he, he leaves the children in the forest, but he doesn't really want his children to get lost in the forest, so he leaves them a trail of crumbs. So when they wake up in the morning, they will find their way home, because the crumbs lead home. So the children go to sleep. When they wake up in the morning, somebody has got up earlier than them, and it's the birds, and the birds have eaten all the crumbs. So instead of finding their way home, they set off to find their way out of the forest, and they find their way to the wicked witch's house. And eventually, they find their way into the wicked witch's cooking pot. And I think that's a picture of what's happening in the world. We have got lost outside the garden. We don't know that, we don't understand it, but we have a longing to find our way home. And God has left us clues, and Satan is very busy coming and snatching away the crumbs. So instead of finding our way home, we find our way to the witch's cooking pot in all its various ways. So God gave me some clues that I might find my way home. And I'm going to tell you very quickly what those clues were. The first clue was the clue of creation. Since the creation of the world, we're told in Scripture, God's invisible qualities, eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without an excuse. Everybody can see the stars. Everybody can see the clouds. Those prompt us to ask questions, and they did me as a child. I remember feeling my heart race when I looked at clouds and wondered who's up there and what's up there and could somebody have made this and of course scripture tells us the heavens declare the glory of God and my heart was racing about the glory of God but I didn't know who God was. G.K. Chesterton came to a place in his life when he said I had always believed that the world involved magic now I thought that perhaps it involved a magician. 
And I came to that moment, maybe there was a magician, maybe somebody made all this. And I began to glimpse, I began to pick up the crumbs that God had laid out for me. The next one was I glimpsed the character of the Lord Jesus Christ when I knew nothing about him in a very unlikely person who was a Christian teacher at my school. He was the physics teacher. He had little glasses and a balding head. And not only did he teach physics, which I absolutely hated, but he also taught religious studies, which I also hated. I found it incredibly boring, and we were 30, 15-year-olds on a Friday afternoon being taken on Paul's interminable missionary journeys. And I just thought the whole thing was a complete waste of time. So we'd done weeks of this. We were all kind of yawning, and suddenly the little physics teacher stood up in front of us and said, I've been teaching you all about St. Paul. I am a saint with a little s. And we're like, you're the physics teacher. I mean, I didn't know scripture. I didn't know scripture says all of us, part of the body of Christ, were all saints. I didn't know that. And this brave little man in front of these rampaging 15-year-olds told us. He nailed his colors to the mast. And we just thought it was mad. And I, I actually mocked and I made up a little song. I am a saint with a little s. And we all kind of sang it. So... That saint with a little s became my hero about a week later when he called us all together. He was our homeroom teacher and now God spoke to me through my conscience because he called us together to rebuke us about the fact that we had a Latin teacher and the Latin teacher was having a nervous breakdown and our class was helping him. And kids can be absolutely ruthless. And the saint with the little s stood in front of us all and he said, if you walked past a man lying in the road with a broken leg, would you all kick him? And we all just sat and looked at him and he said, because that's what you're all doing with Mr. whatever his name was, I'm not going to say it. And he said to us, I want you to sit and write down everything you did in the Latin class for a week. It was not pretty what people wrote on those pieces of paper. And we were soundly rebuked by his still, calm presence in the midst of us. I went home that night, and I went to my bedroom, and I didn't know who God was, but I had a horrible feeling he was very cross with me. I didn't want him to be cross with me. I didn't want the God I didn't know to be a cross God, because I knew what it was like to have a dad who was cross. So I sat there, and I felt God touch my conscience. I felt like that girl in Jane Austen's book, Emma, who's very mean to her friend, and another friend comes along and says, badly done, Emma. And I felt God poke me that day and say, badly done, Hillary. And I felt shame. And then God very kindly came to me in a completely different way, and it's what I would call a caress. I, I did a lot of athletics, um, sprinting when I was younger, and I had been running in a championship, and I had won. I had won the 100 meters, the 200, the long jump, and I'd got this up for the best athlete and I was so excited and I got off the bus that night and said goodbye to my friends but I was very humbled by what I could do on the track and that night as I was walking home and the sun was going down I became aware of the presence of God around me because I looked at my legs and I said out loud there's no thanks to me that I can run and I almost heard an audible whisper saying, no, it's thanks to me. I made those legs and I gave them to you to enjoy. And I had felt what, if you've seen the film Chariots of Fire, Eric Liddell speaks out that many of us experience, God made me for a purpose and he made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. I didn't know God. I didn't know Jesus Christ. I, I didn't know anything. But when I ran... I knew this wasn't thanks to me, and I felt God's pleasure. And then it all went pear-shaped, and I became ill. I couldn't play field hockey. I couldn't run. I couldn't go out and party. I wasn't allowed to drink any alcohol. My liver was sort of caving in, and I had jaundice, and I sat in my study at university, and I was just to be a good little girl and go to classes and write my essays. Life was taking a very different turn and in the midst of it my mum arrived to stay with me for a few days we planned it I was so excited she came she bought her cake which she would always bring to university we sat down we had a cup of tea and then she said what I will never forget Hillary I've left your father and about half an hour later my father arrived and the followed two hours which broke my heart my dad sat in one room 
my mum in another. I went backwards and forwards between them. He begged my mum to come home. I had to go back and say to him, she will not ever come home. It's over. Please leave. That is very, very hard to do to your father. And he drove away, and that was it. It was over. These were not the days of counselling. These were not the days of a big support network. We weren't a part of a church. They had nobody to help them. And God now moved in because I became desperate. Now I began to seek for real love because I thought, is this love? 25 years, whoosh, it's done. What did that mean? And I had a friend who knew Jesus. And he said, I want to tell you about God. And he gave me a Bible and I threw it back at him. And I said, that is a stupid old book. It has nothing to do with me. I'm 19 years old. That was written thousands of years ago. And he picked it up and he gave it back to me. And he said, just look for Jesus and read John's gospel. And I did. The term broke up. It was summer. I was working in a bar, actually. And I'd take my break in the in the day and I would read and read. So I was a barmaid sitting behind the bar sometimes reading John's Gospel. And eventually I came to see Jesus. It was all a bit misty to me but one day I knelt down in the back garden and I said to Jesus, I know you're here and I have a sneaky feeling you've been here all along. And I just uttered his name. That was all my prayer was, Jesus. And I heard him say, welcome home. Welcome home. And that was the beginning of my life with Jesus. He was the final piece of the puzzle. Jesus Christ. And my parents hadn't deliberately led me to God and they hadn't deliberately led me away from God. Let me quote to you what Henry Nouwen says. How do we know about God's love, God's generosity, God's kindness, God's forgiveness? Through our parents, our friends, our teachers, our pastors, our spouses, our children. They all reveal God to us. But as we come to know them, we realize that each of them can reveal only a little bit of God. God's love is greater than theirs. God's goodness is greater than theirs. God's beauty is greater than theirs. And at first, we may be disappointed in these people in our lives. For a while, that they, we thought that they would be able to give us all the love, goodness, and beauty that we needed. But gradually, we discover that they were all signposts on the way to God. Jesus says, you do not know now what I am doing, but later, later you will understand. And however good or bad your parents have been, with God's perspective and redemption, instead of them being a roadblock so you can't move on, or a ball and chain that just keeps you in the past, they can actually become the signpost. To the one who says, I am the way. And I had allowed myself to be gathered in. And I had stepped into Psalm 23. Now I could say, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. You see, when you don't know the shepherd, you don't lie down. You're normally an extremely busy person. And I hadn't been able to lie down. And sheep will only lie down when they're free from all fear. And I was consumed with fear. They'll only lie down when they're free from all friction. And I was brought up in friction. I, I knew all about friction. <laughs> and therefore I didn't know peace. They'll only lie down when they're free from flies and parasites which wheedle their way under the skin and and lay eggs. And I had a lot of thoughts that had wheedled their way into my life and were producing eggs and more thoughts. And they'll only lie down when they're free from hunger. If you see a restless flock, it's because the shepherd is failing to provide the green grass for them to lie down on. I was full of longings and hunger and fear and all the things that prevented me lying down. And we are all full of longings. And maybe you don't allow yourself to listen to the longings of your heart. And when they surface, you just get busy. You drown them out or you try and be successful or you do anything, anything but attend to that 
need deep down inside yourself. God has put desires in our hearts. And let me tell you an amazing truth about those desires. They were put there to lead you to God. He puts the desires in our hearts and only, only God can satisfy the desires he puts in your heart. I want to quote to you from a book called Seven Longings of the Human Heart by Mike Bickle. I haven't read the whole book. I didn't get beyond the introduction. It's so amazing. He says this, There are inescapable cravings in the core of every human heart that cannot be ignored, denied, or pacified. They must be satisfied. We have longings and yearnings placed deep within us by God for the purpose of wooing us into his grace and his presence. We are made in his image, and he intentionally planted longings deep within our hearts that only he can fill. There are cravings put in us strategically by God and they entice us into his presence. We have built into us a God-shaped vacuum which remains empty until we allow God to fill it by fulfilling our deepest longings. How are you doing with your longings? Are you allowing them to woo you into his presence or are you continually blaming your leaders, your parents? They weren't enough. They didn't do enough. They didn't give me enough. They didn't understand enough. They didn't care enough. So now, because you live in a world of blaming, you've walked into a marriage, and guess what? <laughs> You're still wounded. And the very things you hate, you are reproducing. You have never let go. I was at a teen challenge fundraiser a couple of weeks ago and at my table were two young men who have been in the teen challenge program which is a drug rehabilitation program. Both had been in there 11 months and one said to me, I am now free. He's been discipled, he's come to know Christ, his worth in Christ and I asked him, what was the turning point for you on this journey? And he said to me, the turning point was when I stopped blaming my mum. I spent my whole life saying I'm depressed because of her, I'm a drug addict because of her, and yes, she caused me a lot of hurt, but I was angry, and my anger was my own anger. And so I repented of it, I took responsibility for it, and God set me free, and I set her free. You see, your parents, through their love, and their inadequacies both have awakened in you a longing that they cannot satisfy. Only, only God can satisfy. Have your parents failed you? Will you fail as parents? Yes, yes. With the best of intentions. Are the hurts buried inside you valid? Absolutely they are. They are very, very real. This is not about negating or belittling hurt. It's about letting God redeem and restore and use these things to draw us, to be gathered through this pain to himself. There are very few parents who set out to fail. There are very few parents who deliberately hurt their children. But unintentionally, we all wound, and parents wound their children. So what do we do with that wound? Do we react for the rest of our lives when somebody inadvertently knocks into that wound and then they just get a backlash, which is nothing to do with what's happening and is rooted in something that happened years ago? Do we just pick at the wound all the time? I met a man recently, an old man who had been married four times. He had destroyed every marriage he'd been in with anger, alcohol abuse, and violence. And I said to him, where did this start in your life? And he said, it started when I was a little boy squeezed under my bed with my hands over my ears, hiding from the shouting and swearing and crashing that was going on in the room next door while my alcoholic father battered my mother. So this little boy had lived inside this man for a long time in his life. They never knew he was watching. They had no idea the damage they were doing. And he never knew that God was watching all of them. And they all needed the shepherd. 
And finally, through an amazing woman, he's received love and he's been able to love again and he's now been married for 24 years. Let me tell you this life-changing realization I've come to through this verse, really, as I've tried to figure out how does the shepherd draw us to himself? How does he gather us through everything that's happened in our lives? The very wounds we receive can be the door we walk through to be gathered into his arms. I've told you in my life, my deepest wound happened in those few hours that day at university when I was 19 years old. In a few hours, home as I knew it ceased to exist. It would never be there again. And because of that, it became my deepest wound. And because of that, it became my deepest longing for home. And my longing for home brought me home to God. My longing for love that had evaporated brought me to the one who says perfect love casts out fear. My longing to trust again, which had disappeared, <laughs> drew me to the one who said never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. I love my parents. I have never doubted their love for me and I never will doubt it. But their love wasn't enough. It wasn't enough for each other and I got caught in the middle. They reached their limit and they didn't know about bringing me <laughs> to Jesus. But Jesus said, I'm going to gather her in anyway. And this is not going to be a roadblock. It's going to be the very thing that brings her, her home. We don't realize as children that our parents struggle. We don't want them to struggle. If we see them struggling, it's almost impossible for us to deal with because we can't actually help. And so we feel very, very powerless. David was a shepherd and he, as he wrote the Psalms, he wrote about what he saw around him and he cried out, Why are you downcast, O my soul? He knew all about downcast sheep. Notice the other sheep is not helping. It cannot help. It needs a shepherd to come and put this sheep back on its feet. Charles and I lived in a field for years, surrounded by sheep. We often saw downcast sheep. They are so hard to put back up. You've got to get into them and get your foot against them and heave them back up again. And no other sheep can do it. I couldn't do it for my mum and dad. I just, I couldn't fix it for them. Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? We need the shepherd to restore. We need the shepherd to put us back on our feet. And I allowed my longing for home to bring me home. I don't know what your deepest longing is, what the deepest desire of your heart is. God gives us the desires of our heart. And if you don't know, then you need to ask yourself another question. What's the deepest wound in my life? And that will have created your deepest desire. Let me read to you from Henry now and again. Your life story is a beautiful and mysterious story. And without any doubt reveals that you've been wounded along the way. You've been wounded because you experienced God's first love through the brokenness of those who reflected God's love to you. Your father, your mother, your brother, your sister. They are people who loved you to a greater or lesser degree, but who were limited because of the wounds of their own lives. Sometimes they loved you in ways that were painful for you. They wounded you, not because they wanted to, but because they are broken people. There is a deep breakage. Your parents inherited it. So did you and I. We are born to love, but we cannot love unconditionally. It's wonderful and it's terrible. You grow because of it and you suffer because of it. We all know about wounding. I want to finish with a story about a man whose life illustrates how our wounds can be the very thing that allow Jesus to gather us into his arms. A few months ago, I was in South America in Bolivia with the Living Truth team, and we were meeting amazing hidden people who have little radio stations, and they beam out Living Truth in Spanish, Viva la Vedad. And we met a man called Nelson. Nelson picked us up, we traveled for eight hours, way out into the countryside, 
past roadblocks, in an old van with no brakes, bald tires. It was the very, very hairy journey. And finally, we arrived at his home. Nelson drove this vehicle. Nelson has one leg, and this was a stick shift vehicle. So, it was a pretty nerve-wracking journey, and I sat down with Nelson because I had to hear his story that day before the sun went down. And as he told me his story, his chest heaved as he was unlocking painful wounds and secrets from his past. And Nelson told me that when he was born to a very young mother, that very same day, his father died in the very same hospital of alcohol poisoning. He grew up in poverty. He started to beg to overcome their hunger. And Nelson said this, his mother would go out to look for him. Many times when she found me on the street, she took me back home, sometimes hitting me or crying so I wouldn't leave home where we used to live. She got married again and she had a good husband and she told me, he is your father. And I didn't know about the death of my real dad. I thought he left and that he was going to come back. So when I saw this gentleman, I was happy, thinking he was my dad, but he wasn't. This is an orphan boy longing to come home, longing to find his father, his heavenly father. And so the time came when Nelson was asked by his mother to promise he would never do what he'd been doing again, and he promised, and he held it for about a week. He was in his teens, and she said, never come home again. This is why I identify with this man. He lost his home, and he became involved in violence, working, getting money in the cocaine trade. His whole area is soaked in the cocaine trade. In the midst of his pain, he began to wonder about God and is there a God? But there was nobody to explain anything to Nelson. And he decided that he would try and change. One night, he was on a train. It was very hot. And he was on the train illegally. So he went up to try and get some fresh air on the roof of the train. And whether it was on purpose or by accident, somebody pushed him off the roof. And Nelson fell under the train. The train sliced his body basically in half, took his leg off, took half his arm out, sliced his stomach open, and his guts fell out onto the road next to him. And he remembers people and a light, and he remembers thinking, if I can just get my head on the track, the next train will slice my head off. But he couldn't. And somebody picked up the pieces and took the body into the hospital. And in the hospital, I'm sure they were well-meaning, people came to Nelson and said, Nelson, God loves you. And he told them where to get off. He was so hurting. He had just said to God, I want to be different, and this is what had happened to him. Eventually, a woman came to him when he began to start to heal. And she said to him, God has kept you alive, and therefore he must have a purpose for your life. And she gave him a New Testament, and he began to read the New Testament. I've never heard anybody come to Christ over this verse, but Nelson did. He read, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. And he actually said, thank you, God. He is a remarkable man. He had found his way home, literally through his wounds. He now has a beautiful wife who just got to know him to encourage him. He married her. He has two daughters. They have a little TV station. This family loves Jesus. They love him so much that this girl changed high school. She lost all her friends so that she could go to a school close to home, so that she could walk home at lunchtime and turn the satellite dish into a different position so it would beam out the message of Christ to lots more people in the afternoon. They sacrifice beyond sacrifice, and all he cares about is that the people out there who have the question, is there a God, will hear an answer. Right next to Nelson's home, we stumbled upon another family. They were in a shack. They were selling water, and as a team, we'd stopped for water, and as we paid for the water, I watched the parents with a little five-year-old girl. They were standing next to an upturned tree stump, and on the tree stump was a piece of leather, and they were putting coca leaves in the leather, which can become tea or cocaine. And they would fold over the leather and bash 
the leather with a, a hammer and then they would take all the crushed leaves and put them in little bags and sell them, probably for cocaine, highly unlikely for tea. And the little girl, five years old, watched Mummy and Daddy bashing the leaves and she put out her hand and said, can I have the hammer? So now she stands there and all she wants to do, like all of us, when we build a sandcastle on the beach, look Mummy, look Daddy, am I doing it right? So she put the leaves in and she put the leather over and she bashed it with the hammer. And what will become of her life? She's five. It broke my heart watching this child and I just prayed, God, let her parents hear Nelson's broadcast. You see, her parents, they probably have no other way of making money. And that's what they're doing. And she totally, unwittingly, has been led into their lives. I don't know whether you had the best parents in the world or the worst parents in the world. I've heard people say, I love the fact that my dad was a pastor. I've heard kids say, I hate the fact that my dad was a pastor. You make your choice with how you respond to the family that you were invited into. Scripture tells us he puts the lonely in families and yet sadly, they're the place where we become more lonely and then we long for God himself. Parents, let your children go when you've shown them the way. Let them discover, I am the way, the truth, and the life for themselves. Let them discover he's the protector when you don't. He's the provider when you can't. He's the comforter when you're not there. And children, did you have good parents? Let them go. Did you have bad parents? Let them go. There is resurrection beyond the wounding. Have you ever noticed the resurrection body, the resurrected body of the Lord Jesus Christ had wounds? Why? Why? Why was it not resurrected perfect? Why is the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world sitting on the throne in Revelation and he looks as a wounded lamb? Why? So that like Thomas, who doubts, who says, show me your wounds, Jesus says, put your hand in my wounds. He was wounded for our iniquities. We all like sheep have gone astray. We wounded him. And yet his wounds become the place of our healing. And my wounds become the place of his healing. If I will allow myself to be gathered in. Only he can satisfy. He tends his flocks like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his heart. He carries them close to his heart and he gently leads those that have young. I want to ask you this morning, what are your longings? What are your deepest longings? Let them lead you to the good shepherd. Let God be the one who satisfies the longings that he created in you. No one will ever satisfy your deepest longings and they were never meant to. Only God.